Let's focus on our big story for today, looking at the projections for the U.S. economy for us to do an, a, a reassessment. The interest rate has been of concern to some experts when it comes to the issue of the interest rate. Some experts have projected that the Federal Reserve might likely maintain the present status quo or make a slight increase. But the Federal Reserve has also maintained that it's not under pressure to increase the interest rate as far as year 2024 is concerned. What will be the implication for this? We're being joined by in-house analysts. We have Sam Horuji, who joins us this morning to provide a better perspective about this development. Sam, good morning. Good morning, friendly. Very well. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, blessing. Today. And thank you. All right. So let's look at um, the U.S. economy. The issue of interest rates has been of concern to experts. There are some who are predicting that, okay, the present rate is going to be maintained for a while, which is about 5.2%, between 5.2% and 5.5%. You know, the Federal Reserve, which is just like our own CBN here, has maintained that it's not under any pressure to increase it. And as President Lee said, is maintaining it uh, in order to be able to control the inflation. What's your take on this? Uh, this is a big uh, job uh, for Jerome Powell, who is uh, the chair of the Federal uh, Reserve oh. Bank. The issue is uh, a bit political. Uh, you know, this is an election year in the United States of America, so that's uh, uh, not surprising. But when you talk about uh, not likely um, to reduce the interest rates and um, the employment um, issues, uh, the cost of living in there, just the same way we're experiencing here, uh, is on the high side. So I, I, I think that statement uh, sounds to a very large extent political, but uh, they will be meeting shortly, uh, maybe by next week. Uh, maybe when they meet, just the way our CBN met uh, about um, a week ago, then we'll be able to um, look at the issue. But by and large, um, the U.S. economy uh, still remains the economy to beat. I uh, see the best, uh, fastest growing economy, uh, followed by China, uh, Japan, no, Germany and Japan. So when you look at those indicators uh, in terms of um, the general look for the year, it looks bright, but um, the other trends uh, that will spike up inflation uh, need to be controlled. So whether they are going to reduce it um, from 5.2 percent, the projection is that it should come to about 3 point something percent, which uh, is the expectation for the economists who did those uh, forecasts. But however, um, based on the projection of uh, last year, uh, November, there seems to be a uh, hope that those uh, uh, interest uh, rate cuts may not be uh, taking place. But then it's an election year, so let's uh, wait uh, to see what uh, Jerome Powell uh, and his team will do uh, just a few days uh, from now. All right, the statement that the U.S. economy is strong and rates uh, are unlikely in 2024. Let's look at U.S. economy being strong. What are the indicators that shows or says that the U.S. economy actually is strong? What are the pointers to that? Okay, um, when you look at um, uh, the GDP to uh, capital ratio, uh, GDP to um, uh, debt, even though America is uh, uh, regarded as one of the most indebted countries across the world, but when you look at um, the internal dynamics and uh, what shape the economy in terms of manufacturing, uh, in terms of population index, uh, they stand strongest and uh, they remain, um, at best, uh, a leading uh, light when it comes to democracy, which is equally uh, 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 an investment uh, attraction to the United States of America. So, but again, uh, if you look at it deeply, uh, there are issues uh, even within the U.S. economy, but uh, as a dominant power, uh, they have always remained uh, on top. So that's what I can say for now. 
All right, L let's revisit the decision to keep the interest rate at uh, what it is now by the Federal Reserve. Looking at the strategy deployed, is done in a, in, with a motive to control the inflation. That sounds like the same strategy I own CB CBN deployed a few days ago, you know, where it decided to increase um, the interest rate, the benchmark interest rate from 18.75 to 22.75. Are there similarities here? Looking at the strategies being deployed by the Federal Reserve in controlling inflation and that of our CBN here. Well, in terms of similarity, uh, the function of the central bank is uh, to regulate the activities of uh, commercial banks uh, within the country and um, a backer of last resort. But uh, we cannot say so. They are thinking of reducing uh, to a lower digit, whereas uh, we are putting above uh, a two digit. Uh, I'm talking about the strategy to keep it so that it, the strategy to control inflation this time around. So I'll no, we are trying to say whether there's similarity in terms of strategy now i i don't share that uh, uh, that uh, view what we did recently in nigeria was uh, to move the rate at which you give uh, money to the central bank from about 18.75 percent yeah to 22.75 percent to more purposes uh, yeah well, that's 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 the that's that's the scenario here yeah but on the other hand people are saying that um, the current interest rate which hovers between 5.3% uh, to 5.7%. The forecast is to reduce it to 3 point something percent. Rather, you are you, you're building up your rate because once that has been increased, the rate at which the commercial bank are going to lend to the risk sector will increase um, um, marginally. And to that extent, the rate of inflation you are trying to control uh, will, grow, will go up again. So I don't really see, in terms of control measure as a central bank, who is a core regulatory function, yes, they have similar responsibility, but in terms of um, cutting interest rates, our own interest rates is, uh, is going up. So when the lending from, the com uh, from central bank to the commercial bank is, is up, then there's a likelihood that um, by the time they come out with uh, February's um, inflation rates, there may be a spike in that. Uh, that's, that's my personal assessment. All right. Uh, looking at it from here, uh, taking from where you just left off, uh, you, a comparison has been made between the strategy uh, employed by the U.S. to control inflation and the strategy used by the Nigerian CBN to control inflation, which was rates uh, to increase interest rates. All right. So in the case of the U.S., uh, when they increase rates, inflation actually dropped from when it peaked in 2022 but in the case of nigeria as we've seen whenever rates are increased it doesn't give a corresponding result of inflation reducing what could be the difference between the u.s economy that makes increase in rates work in reducing inflation but it doesn't give the same results in nigeria number one uh the data are more authentic uh in the first instance Number two, the regulatory framework is um, uh, well regulated compared to uh, what we do here. Uh, I look at um, the level uh, of what has happened within the foreign exchange market in recent time. Uh, I guess that that kind of scenario uh, will not happen in the U.S. So regulatory framework are tighter. Uh, there's a discipline. There are data unlike here where um, the data that is disaggregated to a very large extent, in my view, uh, does not speak to the real issue. So those are some of the um, differences uh, that we can see. So you can see that rather than trying to um, increase on the rate, we are trying to cut down on the current to see how they can get to almost a base digit like in Europe when you have about two point something uh, percent currently. All right, talking about U.S. economy being strong, let's look at the job report for January. The projection was to have 185,000 jobs, but eventually about 353,000 jobs were added in January. What's, what does that suggest to you about the U.S. economy? Uh, I think they focus more on the risk sector, micro uh, enterprise, 
uh, there's a greater support. So once you're able to create that, then the level of employment uh, uh, improve. But the reverse uh, uh, is the case here where uh, the risk sector don't even get uh, uh, the uh, support uh, from the government and rather than supporting them so that they can create uh, the level of uh, productivity and employment, the rates on the other hand here uh, try to siphle uh, productivity. Uh, micro and medium uh, enterprise uh, are shocking uh, to death. So that's, that's, that's some of the difference. All right. Now for some of the indicators uh, that uh, brought about the conclusion that the U.S. economy is strong, one of them is consumer spending, which remains resilient. Uh, but how will the, 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 the trouble with uh, energy, the high energy cost, how would that at the end of the day affect uh, consumer spending and the inflation rates in the U.S.? going forward in this year? Do you and think there's said, a chance uh, for inflation yeah, that's to what, rebound? That, that, that's, that's what I said earlier that uh, uh, Jerome Powell has uh, his job cut out because on the other hand, uh, consumer uh, spending uh, has been very good, but then the cost of energy has uh, risen. Therefore, the disposable income that is available to spend is gradually going to reduce. To that extent, it will have negative impact on uh, consumer spending, which will drive up the rate of inflation. So this idea whether you are going to cut or not going to cut will be determined by the market forces in the long run. All right, let me point your attention to a statement made in that regard from the Federal Reserve. It says, strong job growth and higher wages make it easier for consumers to spend. But the federal worry is that too much spending will push inflation backward. How that is exactly what I've just said. Yeah. So if um, there's um, improvement on uh, job creation, people have access to wages and salary, then that means they have more disposable income to spend. But on the other hand, the cost of energy is going up. So that disposable income that is uh, available uh, will be uh, taken in terms of what you spend for energy. Then the savings that you have made from uh, consumer uh, goods like uh, groceries and all that will now go into energy. T automatically, in the long run, it's likely to impact negatively on even the uh, spending um, framework that the job creation has opened up. Wouldn't it be, be, be a smart decision at that point? to cut down rates. Well, that would be, not be smart at that time? Yeah, that would be within the framework of uh, the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, we may not be competent to say uh, particularly when they are going to meet uh, by next week. So when they make a final decision based on their data, the data within the Federal Reserve, the projections made by uh, rating agencies like uh, uh, the Global Rating Agency, SP500 Global Rating, that brought about uh, uh, this um, discussion that we're having that uh, the American economy stays strong, but are they going to cut or not cut rates? So that would be at the purview uh, within the, uh, those who make decisions at the Federal Reserve Bank. Let's look at the implication of um, the present decision not to raise the interest rate, which is not likely uh, until the meeting being slated for March 20th take place. But what might likely be the impact for investors? We're talking about the 60s is now, talking about consumer spending, right? But now let's talk about the investors. What would be the impact of this decision to maintain this interest rate? What would be the impact on them? Well, once um, there's um, a problem within the economy, uh, particularly um, dislocation uh, as a result of some of um, the decision made by the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, it's likely to affect uh, the volume of inflow uh, into the United States of America like any other other place. But then when you look at uh, the percentage, uh, they are marginal. Uh, to that extent, I don't think it will affect uh, major investment decision in the United States of America. I think investors will still like to uh, take advantage, particularly from the point of view that um, 
uh, job creation uh, is on the increase. And once people have access to disposable inc uh, income, therefore manufacturing uh, of consumer products uh, will always have market for their products. So, and there will be a return on investment. But the aggregate in terms of what comes to uh, investors or entrepreneur is what uh, we may advance as we progress uh, the conversation. All right. Uh, aside uh, the rise in energy costs, are there other global factors that could impact the U.S. economy? Uh, the election, uh, one, uh, the election that is coming up um, between Trump and uh, the Democratic <laughs> Party uh, may have some significant impact in terms of um, the way investment flow in. Uh, that's one. Then the global economy is equally uh, troubled. Uh, the cost of living uh, is on the rise, not only in the global south here. Some other countries are equally facing that. So to a large extent, that uh, we impact on that uh, economy. Issues of migration, particularly from uh, Latin America into the U.S., continue to play out in terms of how that we impact on those uh, economies. There are other factors um, generally within the global uh, dynamics based on the uh, general outlook uh, for 2024 beyond those factors that we just mentioned. I was expecting you to talk about the, the Russia and Ukraine war, talk about what is going on in Israel and Gaza and then the support being given, the humanitarian support being given by the U.S., if that would be a factor as well. Don't you think so? Well, for me, I think um, uh, America has been mounting um, uh, the humanitarian... Um, Why did you say mount? When you say mounting is that um, when you instigate policy wars, and on the other hand, because of election that is coming up, you are dropping some uh, uh, food ration uh, in, in the Gaza Strip. I see that as um, a political expediency. Is it that um, precaution on the part of safety? Uh, it's better done rather than not doing it. No, I don't, th I don't think so. Uh, when you, to... Over the years, when you have escalated, rather than de-escalating de that crisis, towards the end, because you're going into an election, you're trying to provide some um, uh, mirror imaging uh, for repetition management. But the evidence rather, is there that the humanitarian aid started immediately the war broke out, not just now, where you, where you are in the Well, but you, you cannot support a particular group against okay. another group. Yes, it's, it's, it's in the public domain where you feel the right of certain people uh, is far better than another. So that's, that's, that's one of the concepts of uh, creating proxy wars. Then if you go to Ukraine, look at the commitments uh, they, they, they've made over the years. Uh, in the last two years, and uh, one more or thereabouts, there are a lot of things in the public space. But in terms of reality, some of this commitment has not got into Ukraine. And you can see the, uh, the negative impact and the damage uh, to Ukraine uh, over time. So that's why I use the word mounting democracy, whereas you are promoting uh, uh, proxy wars so that you can sell your war machines. Uh, out. I, I think that is the position. <laughs> the word mounting sounds debatable, but let's leave that. No, that's my position. That's yeah, why I said I, I right use that opinion, word. Yeah. So you can look at that word more critically. You are a beacon of democracy, but what you uh, push, you don't really practice. And, and, and you see the role of America elsewhere. We know what it did in some other country and the repercussion. Look at uh, Iraq. I don't want to mention another country that they devastated so much. So and that's, that's of a truth. All right, talking about the Ukraine and Russia war situation. Now, before the war situation, Ukraine and Russia were the largest producers of wheat in the world. Now, uh, that seems to have, the, the war situation seems to have created an opportunity for American wheat markets. What's your thoughts on it? But to what extent, what volume of wheat uh, uh, that comes from uh, the United States of America in comparison to Russia and Ukraine, even in spite of the disruption uh, in the wheat uh, supply chain 
uh, management, they still push out uh, weight, but the volume of trade has been disrupted based on uh, the war. So, Americans to a large extent may have benefited in terms of um, their export of wheat to some other country. But how sustainable uh, is that export if uh, the disruption in Russia and Ukraine continue? It's going to have negative impact, particularly on the global south that depend heavily on uh, wheat uh, imports, particularly from Ukraine. So I think it may be a win, a temporary win for the United States of America, but in my view, that may not be sustainable. Let's look at the influence um, of politics on the economy. Of course, you can't rule it out. You know, somehow, whoever becomes the president could have influence on the perception of investors. Now, let's look at, uh, maybe, maybe it's too early, but it's also a force to reckon with. Look at the candidacy of Joe Biden and that of Donald Trump. You know, Donald Trump is gradually becoming a force to reckon with, whether we like it or not, as the statistics have shown. Now, how would the candidacy of these two people affect the benchmark of the performance of the economy and the perception of investors in months to come? All right, I think uh, uh, with the recent poll uh, conducted uh, in the US, uh, Donald Trump is coming uh, very stronger, but within the white supremacy uh, factor in the United States here, uh, Donald Trump may be favored, but um, when you look at it from international uh, political economic point of view, uh, I think uh, Trump coming back into that system, I have a strong feeling that uh, even the West may not be generally disposed towards uh, a Trump administration. Uh, he did some um, damage to the international ecosystem in his four years uh, uh, at the White House. And I think um, though he has an overbearing interest and uh, a political uh, tagline that he used, America first, seems to uh, resonate with uh, a majority of Americans. But I think whoever wins, uh, Americans here remain the strongest uh, democracy and people were always trying to move to the U.S. either for investment or migrate uh, for greener pasture. Looking at the way the U.S. have managed their economy and managed inflation, what are the lessons for countries dealing with very high inflation rate like Nigeria that has inflation rate at about 30% and may even be more by the time the NBS releases the inflation rate for the month of February? What are the lessons to learn? Uh, physical discipline, uh, monetary discipline. Uh, the central bank under the regime of... Uh, Caduso is doing uh, remarkably well, but let's feel that he's able to uh, walk the talk uh, for a long time to come. So you have fiscal discipline in the U.S., uh, even in a country where um, people are even invited to the parliament. Sometimes they don't even honor the invitation. As we speak, next week, uh, Jeremy Powell will be appearing before the House Committee on Finance in the U.S. Congress uh, to defend uh, some of those issues that we were talking about earlier. So if we find a way to see how physical discipline on the side of government in terms of taxation, uh, ease of doing business are maintained, then the central bank in particular uh, may not just be issuing circulars, but must find a way to have a bad eye view in terms of supervision of the commercial banks that some of those uh, infractions uh, that take place in the commercial bank is controlled, then we will um, be able to reduce inflation, more economic prosperity uh, for citizens uh, will come by. Talking about more economic prosperity for citizens, like you said, we're still talking about the lessons for Nigeria. You had a project projection for U.S. job creation of one, uh, 185,000 jobs and eventually 353,000 jobs were created. So what are the lessons for Nigeria here in terms of strategy being deployed? This projection was done earlier, and in January, by the end of the world, almost like a month after, almost double of that was achieved. But here's the case in Nigeria, when we make projections, what do we make of the projections, and what are the lessons for Nigeria when it comes to making projections and then achieving it? 
I think political expediency, um, which is the order of the day here, uh, uh, must be looked into. Uh, earlier in this administration in particular, uh, there were promises that were made to manufacturing uh, companies, medium and small enterprises. Uh, as we speak, uh, I don't know the state of those funding, uh, those projections that were made, we don't really know. So uh, the media, on the other hand, uh, in the agenda setting role, must find a way to have a, a kind of auditory uh, to some of these policy statements like what happens elsewhere. The government made some promises that we're going to give some money to medium and micro enterprise. Uh, this is almost nine months uh, into the new administration. Those projections that were made sometime in June or July last year, uh, I can't really see the impact in terms of um, the lending uh, to those sector, uh, the, the promise for job creation. So these are issues that we must look at critically. So the president must find a way uh, to look at some of those uh, promises, some of those releases that were done, to what extent as those things that shape those promises that they made to the citizen, so that when there are gaps, they, those gaps can be closed, so that we can improve on the way we do things in, in, in our climate. Now, talking about improving on the way things are done, let's go back to the U.S. The, one of the, the strong threats to the U.S. economy, uh, by threats I mean what could raise inflation, is the high energy cost. Is there a way around that for the U.S.? No, while the energy cost is uh, rising, they will find a way uh, to have some physical discipline where that will not really impact uh, drastically on the citizen. Unlike our own case, we're just coming out of uh, the first subsidy remover and there's a, um, a projection outlook by the IMF that uh, for us to stay better uh, for 2024, the government should remove uh, the subsidy for energy. That's the problem because the gains from the first subsidy remover are not really even imparted the citizen. The social intervention uh, uh, promises made by the government, a committee was set up uh, to review that when the Humanitarian Affairs Ministry uh, were paying lots of money into private accounts. But then that uh, energy uh, subsidy remover must be looked at critically until we're able to get reasonable gain from first subsidy remover the government should not even touch. I'm talking uh, about the U.S. I'm saying that, I just use that... As an analogy. As an analogy. Okay. That the U.S., why the energy cost is uh, going up, there are other physical disciplines that they will do so that it doesn't really impact okay. so much on the citizen. And I'm saying, on the other hand, that why governments are finding a kind of social intervention that, cushion, that can cushion the effects of the high cost of energy in the United States of America our own case, there's a clamor that you should remove the subsidy when you don't even have a physical discipline. Uh, the social intervention that you promised the citizen has not been able to get uh, uh, to the citizen in the first place. So, discipline and the uh, government uh, looking at ways to see where uh, there's a high cost of living and finding another way uh, to reduce uh, the impact on the citizen. Talking about high cost of energy in the U.S., it's not just the energy as well. You have hiking food prices, which is a global crisis. Now, let's look at what should be the call to action when it comes to the U.S. economy or the U.S. and that of Nigeria as we wrap up. What are some of the critical steps you think the government of these nations should take to manage the strength where you have hiking food prices, especially in Nigeria, where it's becoming... Uh, a serious issue. You have people looting here and there. What should be the trend? You know, it's always very beautiful to talk about America. <laughs> America has uh, subsidies, food subsidies. They produce massive grains all over the place that don't even get to the market, but it has heavily subsidized. So therefore, uh, for us uh, to control the cost of living here, the government too, where you are taking subsidies from sector where those subsidies have been abused, put them in the critical sector 
particularly in terms of food production, subsidize uh, mechanized farming and all that so that we can have sufficient food uh, that will improve on the standard of living of Nigeria. So, inflation rates in Europe has fallen, but price is still a pressure. What's the missing thing here? I think we have to be careful when we're making uh, uh, discussions about the European uh, uh, zone or the European Union because um, there are countries uh, like Germany and uh, France uh, that has recorded um, a reduction in the level of uh, inflation. But just like uh, America, while the level of inflation is reducing, uh, the cost of uh, consumer goods and even energy uh, is increasing. So it will be too early in the day, just like I mentioned earlier, uh, to celebrate uh, the reduction uh, in um, inflation uh, in Europe. Uh, Christine Lagarde um, is the chairperson of the European Central Bank. Uh, is worried that in spite of the inflation that has been controlled, uh, the price of consumer goods, just like in the US, uh, energy is on the rise. And there's a likelihood that um, they might tinker uh, with the rate of inflation. Uh, when they equally meet, I think about the same period, in, in a few weeks, uh, Christine Lagarde was um, optimistic that um, the issues in France and Germany uh, uh, spotend uh, a better uh, economic outlook for the Eurozone will trickle to some other country. But it's worrisome that um, the price of uh, goods and services, the basic needs of the people, just the way we're experiencing here is uh, on um, the increase. But again, Europe outlook for the year looks uh, good, like that of the US. But to what extent can that level of reduction in inflation, particularly Germany and France? So that's, um, maybe as we progress, be able to speak to specific issues. Okay, let's put statistics to this. According to the status released by the European Central Bank, ECB, um, the inflation rate for January, 2.6%. For February, that's about 2.8%. The highest so far was 10.2% that you had in October 2022. Isn't that a remarkable progress, looking at the strength of the Eurozone? It is, uh, because when you look at the Eurozone as a collective, uh, that's a remarkable improvement. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there are very prominent uh, countries within the European Union or Eurozone uh, that has, have a very strong hold on their inflation. So when you disaggregate the figure uh, to represent the entire Eurozone, uh, I think it looks good. But there are some uh, smaller countries we are going through some challenges in terms of um, energy costs, uh, consumer goods. But by and large, uh, the, the general outlooks uh, look good. And uh, like Christine Lagarde uh, mentioned last week, that um, there's a great deal of uh, improvement in the outlook for the whole of Europe. And they feel that they can sustain that for the remaining part of the year. All right, so for Europe, there, the, there are two results uh, regarding the inflation. Why the headline inflation is at 2.6%, you have core inflation around 3.1%. Now, what could be the reason for core inflation still that high? Uh, well, uh, if you look at uh, the cost of living, let's just uh, put it in one basket so that we may not leave certain um, variables out of the discussion. You can see energy costs, you can see uh, consumer goods on the high side. So that has impacted negatively in terms of uh, disposable income that people have to, to spend in those areas. But like we mentioned, in the case of America, there's a tighter regulatory framework um, within the European zone and at country-specific uh, economic outlook, some countries like Germany and France have done remarkably well uh, in the last uh, uh, one year in that uh, regard. So 
They will still control the uh, rate of inflation to some extent because uh, since uh, Brexit, in terms of uh, the employment outlook uh, in Euro, there's been an improvement as well. And their relationship uh, with um, some Asian country, uh, there was a, an agreement that was signed recently uh, in terms of partnership with, uh, I think, India, if I remember correctly. We had a discussion on that uh, in this uh, uh, station where they are trying to see how they can bring uh, uh, UAE, rather, bring some food uh, from that partnership to enhance uh, consumer um, uh, food in the European zone. All right. You know, the, the EU, they've adopted a common currency, which is the euro. Uh, looking at the strength of this currency, how will you assess, you know, the, the strength? And also, let's look at the EU members. Remember, you know, the nations who are members of EU. What are the common challenges that are peculiar to them? Look at Germany, Spain, and the rest of them. Spain has equally uh, done remarkably well in terms of controlling inflation in the last one year. But the use of the, the EU, uh, the, uh, the, the currency, the common currency, yes, has been there. And that's uh, one of the reasons when uh, you have economic uh, union, so that you can have a common currency that will stimulate trade and investment. And that's what uh, the um, euro uh, has been used uh, in, in, in over uh, how many years? About 30 something years. But uh, the UK decided to leave uh, that union, and I think it's not a wide uh, decision that they left. Some of the challenge of uh, exiting uh, that union, uh, they are still facing that uh, in terms of uh, having uh, drivers to power their trucks, even having people to uh, work in some of uh, uh, the mechanized farm has been a major problem. So the euro uh, is a common uh, denominator in terms of uh, currency that has helped them to uh, integrate more in terms of uh, spending. But in spite of that uh, union, you have countries within th that zone that are doing well, particularly Germany, France, and Spain. Others are doing well as well, but that currency has helped them for integration. All right, so the European Central Bank uh, targets 2% for inflation, according to the president of the ECB, Christine Lagarde. Now, in an interview, she was actually saying 2.1% uh, around that. Do you see that being feasible? Yeah, if you look at the uh, general economic outlook for Europe uh, in the year, it looks feasible. Like I said earlier, uh, those climb, there are some discipline in terms of uh, the physical regime unlike uh, our environment where that is a problem. Uh, there's a title uh, monetary policy that is in, put in place. There's a greater supervision uh, in terms of the parliamentary framework across Europe, in terms of uh, the European Central Bank. Uh, the other common denominator uh, that has helped uh, the European Union uh, to stay uh, good in terms of the mechanism they use in controlling uh, their currency, inflation, and their economic growth. Early exchange, shaping policy, advancing developments.